Biomaterials, a key ingredient of a circular and regenerative economy. This class aims to introduce you to the world of biomaterials from a circular and regenerative perspective, emphasising the need to analyse and take into account the multiple layers of this emerging topic. At Materium, we participated in the EU project Reflow, where we seek to understand and transform urban material flows, co-create and test regenerative solutions at business, governance and citizen levels to create a resilient circular economy. As an organisation, Materium seeks to enable everyone everywhere to participate in the next generation of materials. To this end, we seek to provide access to knowledge and support citizens, communities and organisations to make their own sustainable materials from local and abundant biomass resources. So, what are biomaterials? Biomaterials can be considered as part of the emerging bioeconomy model, a model for industry and the economy that promotes the use of renewable resources with a set of regenerative strategies allowing us to have a more sustainable and circular production in different industries including the material industry. New materials and concepts have emerged that respond to this logic. According to the European Commission, a bio-based plastic or material can be composed fully or partially from biological resources, rather than fossil raw materials. Legally, this doesn't necessarily mean that the biomaterials available on the market are all biodegradable or compostable. Indeed, biodegradable materials can be biomass-based or fossil-based, as their degradation is more by design than by composition. Today, we will explain how we can design biomaterials that are renewable, biomass-based and 100% biodegradable. We will also cover what other criteria needs to be followed to ensure that our production is truly sustainable. As an emerging issue, there is often a lack of clarity about the concepts we use in this area. This is why, depending on the category, biomaterials can be called by different names. For example, depending on how they are manufactured and on what scale, we could talk about cultivated materials in the case of microorganisms such as fungi or bacteria, or crafted in the case of low-scale artisanal production, Depending on their applications and resemblance to technical materials, we'll find materials called bioleather, bioplastics or biocomposites. They can also be named by the molecular composition or ingredients of our material, which we will discuss in more detail later. In addition, we could categorise them by their properties such as strength or flexibility, as well as differentiate them by different formats such as sheets, composites or yarns. But first of all, why biomaterials? We all know how complex the issue of plastic and its subsequent pollution is due to the misuse of the material, which is only increasing. However, the problem with plastic is not its materiality, but the way we produce, consume and dispose of it, without considering that it is a highly durable material that will take hundreds of years to degrade in our system. In this sense, this butterfly diagram by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation proposes to differentiate our production into two loops, technical and biological. For highly processed technical materials, there are several strategies to avoid these materials ending up in the landfill, such as sharing schemes, life extension, reuse or recycling, to constantly keep the same resources in our production. On the other hand, we have the biological cycle, which is based on the use of renewable biomass resources. While certain circular strategies could be shared between the two loops, the big difference is that this cycle is even more aligned with our natural ecosystem. This means that once the life of a product within this cycle is over, it can degrade into nutrients that will feed new biomass resources. So basically, the problem with petrochemical plastics is that we've been using them as if they were part of the biological cycle instead of the technical cycle. So what alternative materials do we need to solve this problem? One of the answers to this issue could be by turning our eyes to nature. This means not only taking inspiration from the structures and applications we can observe in nature, 
but going even deeper to understand the chemical principles of nature and how we can replicate them. It's key to look at the building logic of our ecosystem to design materials that are compatible with it. The core objective is to have the ability to adapt our materials to our local ecology, be more efficient with our energy input and output, and apply life-friendly techniques. The first objective is to utilise locally abundant resources as a primary material source. This will enable us to leverage cyclic processes. The second objective would be to use less energy consuming processes by being smart about how we use our resources, such as recycling all of our materials instead of sourcing depleting raw materials. By implementing these practices, we can start to make real regenerative change. Finally, the use of green chemistry processes which are aligned with nature and encourage symbiotic fabrication will ensure that our materials will biodegrade and will not be harmful to the environment. It's key to include these principles at the core of our production model to promote a more regenerative model across the entire supply chain. Now, why use biomass instead of fossil resources? Not only do we all know how these resources have been rapidly depleting, but there is also an unsuspected amount of biomass that is produced naturally every year. In this graph, we can see how natural macromolecules such as cellulose and chitin are created in exorbitant quantities every year. Cellulose is present in the cell wall of plants, while chitin can be found in the exoskeleton of crustaceans, insects and even fungi. To put this in perspective, the natural occurrence of chitin is around 100 billion tonnes per year, while 8.3 billion tonnes have been generated from plastics since 1950. So we would need to manufacture 300 years of plastics to reach the volumes of one year's worth of chitin. The question here is, why are we not using these untapped resources from nature? And how can we mimic the circular model of nature in order to not generate waste in our production? Sourcing biomass does not always mean using virgin and new resources. There are large quantities of already available organic resources in our cities. As social beings living in a community, there are certain consumptions that are indispensable to us, like elements for construction, transport or food. By default, sourcing and processing these resources to meet our needs creates considerable amounts of resources that we now consider waste. In the food industry, these wastes can be categorised into avoidable and unavoidable, the former being the first edible resources that can be avoided through more efficient management. However, the unavoidable ones, like orange peels from juice production, are resources that could be utilised within a bioeconomy model instead of ending up in the landfill. This is an analysis conducted during reflow by Metabolic of the unavoidable waste from different sectors of Milan's food industry. As you can see, there are tonnes of waste from different products such as used coffee and tea, waste from the meat industry and peels from vegetables and fruits. But how can we use this for biomaterials? Each of those unavoidable wastes is composed of a range of biomolecules we mentioned before, like cellulose and chitin. This means that we either create materials from the composed materials, such as used coffee grains, or we can extract these molecules and use them as resources for new materials. For example, cellulose and hemicellulose can easily be extracted from coffee, orange or banana peels. Other macromolecules, such as starch, can be extracted from bananas and potatoes, or collagen, essentially gelatin, from meat waste. But what are these macromolecules? The basis of these macromolecules are chemical elements present in nature, such as oxygen, hydrogen or nitrogen. These elements are grouped into monomeric small units, such as sugars, which are the building blocks of bigger molecules. The majority of the ones we can use to make biomaterials can be categorised as biopolymers, natural macromolecules produced by the cells of living organisms. These biopolymers are the key ingredients of biomaterials. Each one of them has a different role to play. So while some of the structural matrix that binds the whole material together, others reinforce the material or function as plasticizers. A key element is the use of water as a solvent, 
which enables these biopolymers to form bonds at the chemical level to create new material and eventually will also assist the biomaterial degradation. We will review some of these biopolymers and their applications in the following section. As we've mentioned before, cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer in nature and can be found in plant cell walls and is produced by bacteria, just like the kombucha material that you can see in this image that has been machined by a laser cutter. It consists of microfibrils with a rigid and ordered structure that is responsible for the resistance to degradation of this polymer, which is not soluble in water. These characteristics make it suitable for the development of industrial polymers and applications in the packaging and textile industries. It also has applications in construction and can be used as a resource for biofuels. An example of a cellulose-based case study is Ananas Anam's Pinatex. This is an innovative textile made partially from waste leaves of the pineapple plant. The leaves are the byproduct of existing agriculture and their use creates an additional income stream for farming communities. So instead of extracting the cellulose, they are using the fibres directly. However, to analyse the sustainability of a material, it's not enough that the materiality is bio-based. It's important to look at the source of the resource, whether it's from renewable sources or is adding value to a byproduct. In addition, it's important to check at what scale it is being produced, what applications it has, and whether it's biodegradable at the end of its life cycle. Not least, it's also important to consider social factors, such as integrating and working responsibly with the local community. Another abundant biopolymer and city waste is collagen. One of the main structural proteins of animal tissues and the most abundant in the animal kingdom. Gelatin is extracted from collagen, which is a hydrocolloid, a substance that produces gel on contact with water, which in the case of gelatin is reversible. Collagen is used today in the food and biotechnology industry, besides being used for packaging, glues and textiles applications. Umorphil from Herman Textile is an example of collagen-based material in the market. It's composed of collagen peptide amino acids from recycled fish scales and viscose fibres, designed to be completely biodegradable. A third macromolecule abundantly found in urban waste is starch. This is a polysaccharide produced by most green plants as energy storage. Starch is interesting as a biopolymer material because of its low cost and its availability as a surplus raw material from agriculture. In addition, its high thermal processability makes it in demand for the synthesis of plastics such as PLA, as well as being used for the creation of packaging and glue. Like gelatin, it has wide applications in the textile world and can be used as a resource for biofuel. A well-known example of starch-based material is Nuitan from Crafting Plastic Studio. This material is completely based on renewable biomass and is industrially biodegradable. One of the benefits of Nuitan is that it can be produced in a variety of production methods, including injection moulding and 3D printing. While there are many more biopolymers and minerals to consider, such as pectin or calcium carbonate, we want to highlight the presence of chitin. In the analysis of the Milan waste, the quantity of urban waste of this biopolymer was not particularly high, but it is a resource of high commercial value on the market. In addition, it's highly demanded in the material industry for its outstanding me mechanical properties and general low solubility, which are critical attributes for films and materials for diverse applications. Even at the level of digital fabrication, it has been used for the development of great structures through bioprinting. A great example of chitin-based material is Tomtex from Uyen Tran. This material is still in an R&D process, but has already shown amazing properties presenting itself as a great alternative to faux animal leather. The material is created from shell seafood waste and coffee grounds and can be tailored to formats similar to plastic or rubber. It has great water-resistant characteristics and is completely compostable and biodegradable. So, as we mentioned before, all of these biopolymers fulfil a role in biomaterials. We can now review in more detail how they contribute to the final material. 
An example similar to the one shown before is this agar and gelatin sheet. This material mixes two biopolymers, gelatin from collagen and agar, a macromolecule from the red seaweed. This is combined with glycerol to enhance the plastic properties and dissolved with water to synthesize the sheet. If we want to create a composite and not a flexible sheet, we could add to the same recipe fibers rich in cellulose or eggshell that is mainly composed of calcium carbonate. Depending on the ingredient chosen, our material will have different properties and potential applications. If we categorize some of the mentioned biopolymers by role, we can find some examples here. For the matrix role, we can use chitin, starch, gelatin, pectin from fruits and vegetables and algae-based biopolymers, such as algae, alginate or carrageenan. Then for reinforcing, some examples are cellulose and calcium, which can be easily sourced from eggshells or mussel shells. And finally, we have water and glycerin. This last one can be sourced from both plants and animals. Finally, the last section. How can we make a biomaterial? Before going more technical, it's key to ask the right questions. As we have seen before, this is not only about making material from biomass, but there are many layers and areas to consider to shift to circular and regenerative production models. A way to do this is to review the different dimensions of approaching biomaterial making. First, it's key to assess the macroethical implications of working with raw materials. We must consider energy consumption, inter- and intraspecies relations, and the sustainability of biogeochemical cycles. Then, it's key to consider the context of the territory in which we are, from the type of environment and its available resources, to the structural scales of the site. In the third place, as we mentioned before, the social dimension is key. We need to take into account the implications for all the people and organisations involved in the work with biomaterials. And finally, practical and technical questions are important. We need to define the tools and equipment we will use for our development and which methodologies we will use. Another guideline to review is sustainable and circular principles. This specific list was developed within the Reflow project and you can find more details about how to apply this to cities in the Knowledge Hub section of Reflow's platform. If you review the 10 principles, the first four are highly related to urban resources and this class. However, other topics such as urban ecosystem and governance are also key to consider. Once you have reflected on the previous topics, you're ready to start experimenting. In this section, we'll explain the steps to follow and we'll show you how to make a specific recipe based on urban waste. There are a few actions or steps that you would take to make your material. First, related to biomass sourcing, you'll have to collect and prepare your biopolymers and ingredients. This can be done directly from other entities that already do this process, like buying chitin powder, or you can find a source and extract the biopolymers needed, like extracting chitin from crustaceans exoskeleton. This phase also entails a process as clean, grind or sieve biomass to have your resources ready for making. Secondly, related to biomaterial samples, there is production and intervention. Production means making your biomaterial, like following the recipe that we'll show you at the end of this class. Intervention means which tools and machines you'll use to machine your material, like using laser cutting to cut patterns in your sample, or the finishing process like sanding or coating. Finally, once your biomaterial is ready, the characterization of the material is key. This means testing physical and chemical properties that can be achieved with varying degrees of accuracy by DIY means or by machines like the universal testing machine. Properties such as strength and flexibility can help you define which applications your material is suitable for. Amongst all these tests, it will also be key to analyse the biodegradation rate of the material to ensure that once its life cycle is over, it can degrade into nutrients that will be used again to create a new material. In the following video, we will show you how to make a film based on collagen and cellulose. 
For this, we will use already processed resources such as gelatin and methyl cellulose, a soluble compound derived from cellulose. Firstly, add 300 grams of distilled water to the heat resistant pot. Then add 7 grams of glycerol and stir until the solution reaches 80 degrees Celsius. Fifteen grams of methyl cellulose is then added to the mixture in small portions while stirring until the solid particles have dissolved into solution. Then add 12 grams of gelatin powder and stir. Finally, reduce the heat of the resulting solution to a simmer, approximately 65 to 75 degrees Celsius, and proceed to stir until homogeneous. Remove any lumps or froth with a spatula. The mixture is then poured into silicon moulds and left to cool in the air for 10 to 15 minutes. Once set, the moulds are then placed into a dehydrator or oven for 18 hours at 35 degrees to form the resulting biomaterial. Now you're ready to start making your own biomaterials. If you want to continue developing your materials, keep researching and asking yourself the right questions. There are several platforms that can help you to continue this journey where you can learn and meet people working on this exciting topic. You can also review materium.org and reflowproject.eu for more content on how to work towards more circular and regenerative cities. Thanks for watching this class.